there. First, these straps made me look fat. Anyway, I'm going to show you the poor man's mentalism. Here, come here. Touch one, I'll tell you what you picked. <laughs> here, grab one. Any one you like, it doesn't matter. Look at it. Show the camera. So I know it's the same one. Sign your name across the front of it really big. You can show the camera, you don't show me. And whatever you do, never do this with an ink pen. Don't ever do that. Now, just put your card back on top of me where you wish. Shuffle it back. I'm not holding the place. Now here's where the magic happens. Watch. While this happens, your card didn't disappear like it would in some mammy pammy magic trick. Your card turned invisible. Mm -hmm. I can't find it by looking at it because it's invisible. I can find it by touch. Because once it turns invisible, the texture changes like burlap and silk. And I can find it by, there it is. I'm going to sit it right here. We'll come back to it. Now, you may think I'm crazy. What's your name? Angus. Angus, I'm going through here. Notice that your card, the one you picked, the one you signed, is no longer in the deck. You may see a lot of duplicates. That's why you signed the card. We do this trick a lot. It's filled up with other cards. They got to pick a card. I'll pick one. You see magicians long enough, they pick the same card all the time. Penn Teller is always the three of clubs. It's not because they're lazy. They, people forget their cards. So I use the six of hearts because you can see it from across the room. It's easier to remember. It's not confusing like a face card or the or six, nine, eight, or ten of a club a card. We'll put it back inside this little holder here so I can see where it is. And here's what happens. I'll take your card, put it back in the middle of the deck. This screen is very important. I want you to focus your thoughts through the screen toward the deck, thinking of that one card. Because you have a lot of thoughts there, the screen screen filters out everything else except that card. Your thoughts are a bit weaker, so this gives you the power boost. When it's a deck, the deck actually jumps. It's amazing. So watch it go through the card, comes right up to the screen, jumps around with the Wait a minute. What the heck? Okay. Uh, you thought hard enough off. Not only that, when you thought it, it knocked the six back on top of the deck. That's called keep it on. Illusionary card right, right, right here. No sleight of hand. But I haven't touched this box, have I? Check it out. And that's the illusionary card box and the card box. We're over here. Oh, Make a video of us. <laughs> okay, Lance, we're getting ready to watch the video. Oh, is this video? Yeah, we'll film you. Hey. Uh, and, uh, this is for Mike. So God bless. Dixie's always late. So do I. Audio visual genius. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Which 
full test becomes a test, long test becomes a test. The short becomes long, the long short every time you try to fix out. Some people think they figured it out, so they can connect from up on this pulling it back and forth, but that's not true. So you separate the end, still the short becomes long, the long short will come around. Every time you measure it, you do. So they just say, connect the back. And I'm coming back to the work. No, 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 it's connect the bottom. I get the bottom, I get the top. I'm going to get back to the hand up the other side of the pulling back and forth. I can check that out easily. Now, if you don't come along with the long short, oh, since the lip of laser marker couldn't work then, could it? Yeah, it'd be impossible for it. Oh, my God. Still, the short becomes long and long short. Now, some people, I've already touched the one I dealt. The short becomes long, long short will measure on. Every time I pull the short becomes long, long short comes to this will happen. I just look really good. And it's foolproof. Any four year old child can do it. Not any bad shot. Pull the short. Just make sure it's short. You can pull the short. You can pull the short while it's screaming up there. Quicker to breathe, but. This can move in my face. Well, fortunately enough for me, my sophomore year at Michigan State, learned how to fix things. You take a magic hair, like that. Wrap it on this side, cut it across, wrap it on that side. Strong, straight, you stand like me, let it see it. Well, after I wrap my finger around the hair, the hole back like that, make a boat turn back when it started. That back one hour at first, but it's going too fast. That's the weird stuff. It's in your name. And that's how the time is fixed.
impressive. I don't think I have that much strength. I don't think I have that much strength. Well, I would like to welcome everybody here to the Once at Home. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that you guys are doing to have all Mike's family and friends here from all over the world. Jeff, Susan, his son Travis, Jed. In magic, we have a tradition which has been going back for quite a while now, since 1926 when Houdini passed away. The Society of American Magicians decided to break a wand in his honor. Ever since then, magicians all over the world have been honoring their friends and their family in the same way. Us magicians, we believe that our power comes from our magical wand. He was in the magic shop. And it truly is my pleasure to do this ceremony for my friend. So we are going to break this wand in honor of our today. It is said when you break a wand, the magic flows out of it here on earth. But I know this magic that flows out of this wand today will go with Mike throughout his travels through the rest of his life. So in honor of his family and his friends here today, we would like to break this wand in Mike's honor. And after we break the wand, we're going to have a moment of silence. time I talk to him, no matter um, if it was a problem or just any time, he always left his conversations, you know what, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. All right. Mm -hmm. And you know what, as I look at you guys today, I see so much love in this room, just remember, it's going to be all right. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Does anybody have anything they would like to say about my I'll go first because um, that might make it easier for other people to get up and speak because I can say, well, Lance spoke and he kind of sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, except for Mike's family, I think I knew Mike longer than anyone else here. I met him in the early 70s and uh, I think we figured out he was probably 72, 73. I was like 12 or 13 years old. Mike was probably about 20. Uh, he was a demonstrator at the magic shop in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And we went on vacation that year, and I saw this magic shop, and I was already crazy, crazy about magic, so I spent all my time at the magic shop. And, uh, and, and I met Mike, and he sold the uh, nickels to dimes <laughs> and the card penetration frame. And uh, he was very nice to me and was very kind to me. And that's what I remember about Mike. And that, that, that just goes to show you um, that we should always be mindful when we meet people and how we interact with people, and especially young people, especially kids, that we're kind to them and nice to them. Because you don't know what that's going to do to that person later on in life. Years and years, decades later, that's, that's going to come back. Uh, and, and, and and I always remembered Mike, and when he moved, to, I moved to Vegas in 82, and he moved at some point after that, and was working at Magic Masters, and we, we, we kind of reconnected, and, and, um, and we figured out that, that we had met each other at the Magic Shop in, in Gatlinburg. And, um, and he said he remembered me. So I'm sure it was lying, because... <laughs> <laughs> 
many 12-year-old kids do you mean that you sell the nickels to dime to? You know, <laughs> thousands. Uh, but but uh, uh, he was always very kind to me, and I always loved to see him, and he always came to my show, and he brought family and friends to the show, and I always loved having him at the show, and I'd always introduce him and have him stand up, and I would tell the story about meeting him when I was a kid. And, uh, and, and, and uh, he was a guy that I always, that I always loved. And, 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 and being here today and talking to, to, to Mike's son and his brother and his sister, and we were t I was telling these stories, and, and in the course of telling the story, I remembered something that happened back when I first met Mike. Um, I remembered the very first words I ever said to Mike. Uh, <laughs> just a couple of months before we went on this vacation to Gatlinburg, I had ordered through the mail a deck of trick cards called D Lands Cards. Some of you guys will know what I'm talking about. It was a deck of cards. It was it was marked so you could tell what the card was. There was it was a stripper deck also. Uh, it, it was it was a gaff deck. It looked kind of like a normal deck, and you could it could be examined. But it was all these little marks and stuff on it. Uh, and and in reading the directions, the directions to the card. Let's say this is the back of the card. To tell what the suit of the card was, there was a little circle up in the corner. And you look at that circle, and it would tell you what the suit was. And it was like a clock. And if there was a little dot at the top, that was a diamond. And over here on this side, if there was a dot there, that was a heart. And if it was at the bottom of the clock, no, that was a diamond, clubs, hearts, Spades, and the way you remembered that according to the direction was it stood for D Lands cards have superiority. <laughs> Diamonds, clubs, hearts, spades. It was the first letter of that phrase. D Lands cards have superiority. And that's how the directions taught you to remember which each of those little symbols was. And it was, I guess, the marketing given get you to remember the name of the manufacturer. So I'm at the magic shop and Mike is demonstrating the, the D-Lands cards. And he had a crowd of people there. And I'm like 12 years old and I'm watching him. Oh, I, I, I have this text. <laughs> so I'm going to go meet this guy. Here's a guy. Here's an adult doing magic. I'm going to go meet him. So I waited for the crowd to clear and I walked up to Mike. And I said to him, he came over and I said, Looking right in the eye, and I said, D Land's cards have superiority. <laughs> and he looked at me like, What? <laughs> so, so maybe that's why he remembered me. Because <laughs> I was this nutty kid that came up to him. And then, of course, I had to explain to him, Oh, that's what the directions to the cards say. I just have to stick at home. And he goes, Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, and he was very kind to me. And, first words ever said to him. So, D Land's cards <laughs> and <laughs> See, he sucks. Anybody else? <laughs> I'd like to say something. Thank you. Thank you for stopping you. No, you go to your door. Hi hey everybody, my name is Fielding West. It's great to see all of you here on this solemn afternoon to honor our friend. I want to clear some things up about Lance Burke's story if I can. <laughs> <laughs> I love Michael because Michael was clever enough not to read the directions of anything. Perry will back me up on this. That man had such a great mind. He could come up with anything and have a 12-year-old come up and spout off the directions, Jim. No wonder he was both up. <laughs> the second thing I'd like to clear up, now I want to thank Lance for explaining how this car trick is done so we don't have to see it on the Chris Angel special. <laughs> <laughs> and the most important thing I want to share with you is the first thing that Lance Burton said to this gentleman 
in a magic shop as a 12-year-old, I'm sure went a little more like this. Excuse me, can you tell me where the rubber dog shit is? At <laughs> least <laughs> that was my first question. The first time. <laughs> I like Michael because he would come to my show and he always thanked after saying that word, shit. I, Michael came to me and thanked me for never using any blue material in my act when I was on stage. He said, he always encouraged that, and he always talked to the young magicians, you don't have to say this word, you don't have to use that word to be funny, and he, and, he, and he was nice enough one night at the Magic Meeting with Barry Darwin to say, if you want to go see a show that's family friendly, you go see Fielding West. And I just thought that was the nicest thing that anyone had ever said, because I didn't think that I really portrayed that image amongst my friends. <laughs> But he was very encouraging, and um, I want to close with this. I, I, my heart goes out to, to Miss Lupe, uh, who's done such a fine job in that shop, building and going through the resources. To put this urn together. The last time I was at a memorial service where there was an urn, I did a trick. <laughs> Which Lance has forbidden me to pick this up. <laughs> it's okay, it's better told than it is shown. But she called me to tell me the measurements that she had to put together to make this box the size that it is. And what did I say to you, Lupe? You should have called me, I've got an extra sub trunk in my garage. <laughs> and it might have suited it too, for the, a lot of people don't know what a sub trunk is. That's a real funny when you know what a sub trunk is. <laughs> <laughs> my friend, my
there was Mike in Vegas. I was beginning to think that Mike was the only demonstrator in the entire world. He was the only one that did magic. So, anyhow, um, I always thought that Mike and I would get to spend uh, a lot more time together. Um, a lot more time together, uh, you know, because we both moved to Vegas and. And as anybody knows that lives here, for some reason, you know, uh, like John Lennon said, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Right. And right. time goes by and you don't get to spend the time with someone that you really would like to. And, um, but I was very fortunate because Perry throws a wonderful Christmas party every year for all of his employees, Perry and Waha. And this year, I got to spend a lot of time with Mike at the Christmas party. We sat and we talked about how we knew each other for 30 years and how we're going to have to catch up on things. And, and it was just a wonderful time. And I will always miss Mike. He's a, been a big part of my life. And I know he's waiting to uh, see us in heaven when we get there. He'll be there waiting on us. And I'll say, you want to see a trick? <laughs> but I love the guy. And he is a magical person. And uh, he'll forever be with me. And thank you so much for letting me my friend and I came today, we're not a magic people like you guys are. Mike touched our lives too, and our family's lives. He knew my granddaughter, who will be 20 tomorrow, since she was three years old. He took me to see Lance Burton on my 41st birthday. He went to my best friend's son's graduation. He was at my daughter's wedding. He touched people who were in the magic world like you wouldn't believe. I had to call him up to my family and let them know when Mike died because he had touched everybody in my family's life. As well as everybody in all of yours. I can't express to you how much we're going to miss Mike in the real world and in the magic world as well. It was nice to meet a lot of new people who I've never met before. And I just want you to know his life touched more people than you can even realize. I first met Mike in Myrtle Beach. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say the person that I've known the longest in this room is Dixie Dewey. I met Dixie back in 1979 in Augusta, and uh, Georgia, and about 70 miles. Columbia, Dixie, Columbia is about 70 miles from Augusta. 70 miles. Yeah. We ended up in Columbia, South Carolina, and Dixie used to come up and perform at all the ball shows. And so I used to go hang out with them and see them. And um, I just started Magic in 79. It was around 80 or 81. I used to. Uh, uh, hang out with this guy that sold pianos and organs, and he had had me come along with him to do these outside promotions to show the kids magic while he tried to sell mom and dad a piano or organ. And uh, one of the trips was to Myrtle Beach, actually uh, a little bit south of there, it's a place called Paulding Island. And I uh, had this big festival at the uh, state park, and somebody was telling me, well, there's a guy going around doing magic. So uh, I went around, and there's this guy there with just the case, as Dixie described, he'd set it up and he'd do 10 or 15 minutes and he would walk to another area and do another 10 or 15 minutes. And um, it was Mike. And it was the first time I met him. And I, I was real serious about magic because at the time Copperfield was just like really popular. And I didn't know Lance Burton and I wanted to be David Copperfield. But when I saw Mike, <laughs> Sword through neck, and and uh, I was telling Travis the story earlier. Uh, I can't remember exactly how the, the, the line went, but he did something with the balloon. You know what kind of balloon you want to open it? And he goes. He says, "Yeah, when my son was born, he said they didn't tie the umbilical cord. He went. You know, so I can't remember the exact joke, but it was something like that. But uh, uh, going back to Mike's magic shop in Little Beach, he says, "Yeah, I got a magic shop downtown." So it was either the next day or later that night we went to the, the magic shop. 
And of course, like any magician when you're young, you hang out in the magic shop like a kid in a candy store. Well, Mike had it made because next to his magic shop, there was a shark exhibit. You'd pay like a couple bucks and you'd walk within inches of these sharks. And you were like on a bridge and the sharks were right there. Well, the shark exhibited exodus into Mike's magic shop, so he had a constant flow of traffic. Well, if you remember that day, that constant flow of traffic. So he had it made. So as Casey says, you know, you get busy, life goes on. Probably about 10, 11 years later, I'm living here in Vegas, which I, as a kid, we lived all over. I lived here in Vegas back in the early or late 70s before I even got involved in that. But, uh, <coughs> my girlfriend and I at the time were walking through Caesars, and we see the magic shop, we see a crowd there. So we're watching, and I tell my girlfriend, I said, I know that guy. She says, yeah, it's Tony Curtis. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tony Curtis was there watching Mike do the demo. And I was looking at Mike, and she was looking at Tony Curtis. She said, oh, the guy's So after that, after the demo, we went out and we introduced ourselves to Tony Curtis. But I was like anxious because I know I know this guy. And I can't play some. So I go up and I said, what's your name? And he goes Mike. And as soon as he said Mike, it clicked. We both said Absent at the same time. And. Uh, and at the time, I didn't know, you know, like Dixie said, he worked at, I didn't know later, but he told the story where he worked for Magic Masters in different places, I think. Was it Atlanta or Atlanta, Atlanta and then the Virgin yeah. Islands? Virgin Islands. Yeah. But, you know, I can't say enough about Mike that you don't want to let him know. I mean, the guy's just a great guy. And, and talk about witty. And he's right. probably, and me being a magic demonstrator, that I've worked in several magic shops, Mike is probably the best magic demonstrator in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, I'm Dennis, uh, Mike was my best friend, and uh, since the early 80s Mike and I have been sharing apartments in different cities for Magic Masters, uh, Atlanta, New Orleans, Virgin Islands. And uh, uh, I, he was later my best man at my wedding. My wife thought I had another wife. <laughs> <laughs> but all the stories he knew we heard about Mike. Mike said this about this movie. Mike said this about this person. Uh, my, the only really funny story I, I want to say is one time we were, we just went to St. Thomas for the first time. And I was there for a year, and Mike was new back in Atlanta, and they were worried that he couldn't count him himself and by himself down to St. Thomas, which is closer to Venezuela than it is the U.S. And uh, so after my one year down there, he came down there, and I, I said, Mike, you're gonna, there's going to be a lot of wonderful things to do here. It's going to take some money. I hope you save some money. There's catamaran sales, uh, scuba dives. There's helicopter rides. The tourists want you to do all this stuff. It's so much money. He says, oh, I didn't bring that much, but don't worry, I'll be fine. So uh, nine months later, I come back and, oh my gosh, Mike meets me at the airport and says, uh, come on, get hop in the Jeep. And he's got a Jeep, so we go. And it seems like everybody on the island knows him. He's my man. <laughs> and, uh, he says, what do you want to do? You're here for a week before you have to go back. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, well, I have to do a helicopter ride. I know all the people. <laughs> he knows everybody, and uh, uh, they. We went over on a, a party boat, and then it's like magic. Come on, bring him. <laughs> he made soup friends so quickly, I cannot believe it. Um, I thought I was a better magician at the time. And <laughs> we were doing birthday parties and stuff, and they all flocked to Mike. I think children can see him with their eyes, heart, and go. It's pure. He's good, and they look at me like. Loser. <laughs> well, they didn't say loser, but they went like. Um, he always raved about you, and that. Everything. 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 He loved you. You're right. He did. Well, Rocky has put food on our plates. Oh my gosh. Oh, uh, right. Which Wait, wait, wait. You have to stop right now. He came to our restaurant one day with that guy on his shoulder 
and walked through our restaurant. And people were like freaking out. There was a creature in our restaurant, and he had that point to people's tables like to their food. Oh my God! He did. <laughs> they were freaking out. He said, I'm looking forward to going to Canada. I love traveling with Kevin. I got to meet people that uh, all the celebrities at the autograph shows. <coughs> and I'm going there with, I'm just listening. And uh, um, I got back and we talked on the phone. And, uh, I guess he talks to you kind of on a regular basis. And, you know, we all, you know, he said something about, you know, He's got great. He's a man now. He's got. He's. He's got it. He's grown into a real man. He's doing what he wants to do, the, the gaming, and uh, I'm so proud. And uh, I thought, well, you know, this is not the normal conversation you have with somebody, but uh, uh, who would know that uh, it was getting to be late in his life that he was thinking about things serious. And as we all know, Mike, the glasses always have full. It's never half empty. He, he would never let you know anything was wrong. Uh, if, there, if there's a heaven, I think there's got to be. There's got to be kids yeah. up there. And Mike is doing magic. And those kids are going, Mike, magic, Mike, magic. Mike, <laughs> yeah. Mike, you got a lot of people out here that love you. And... I just want you to know Mike loved you guys. Thank you. Um, I didn't know Mike as long as uh, everybody, uh, probably about five years, I guess. Started in 09, back and forth with Gary. I've been around entertainment my, my whole life, though. My father was a showman on this trip for years and years, and old-time burlesque. And we knew Lance and Melinda and Siegfried and Roy growing up. I started in Magic in about 2007 at Houdini's. And, you know, the guys took me through the motions and everything. I, I never thought I could get it, but I did. And then I moved on from there and came over to work for Perry. And I thought, and some of you have heard this story, but I thought I knew a thing or two about Magic coming from there, you know. <laughs> But boy, when I got to, to work for Perry and I got to meet Mike and also Dennis, I learned a thing or two about what it was to be not only a great magic demonstrator, but also a magician. Because the psychology behind the art that all of us love is a whole heck of a lot different than you can learn in any books or videos. But you have to have it hands on. And for me, Mike was, in fact, Dennis as well, the best demonstrator I've ever met. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. And during my time with Perry, I was, and being with Mike and, and also Perry and, and everybody, I was able to learn not only the art of performance and sales, but also, I'd like to say, over the last couple of years, just a little bit of humility, which I didn't learn at, uh, at the... Uh, the <laughs> so, I want to thank Mike. We love you. And I want to thank all of you. Thank you so much. Carolinas and Charleston and did do mall shows. 
and he's married to Mary, and Travis was so young, and, and um, I haven't seen Travis since he was about four or five until today, so this is a world for me, because he talked about him constantly, like, like uh, Dennis has already said, he talked to him, uh, talked with me about Travis and, and how much he loved him. He told me it was the real magic in his life. And, uh, that was only three days before, because Mike did go to Canada with me, but before he died, and uh, we traveled together. Um, I think magic, for me, and I think this is true, and this is probably why Lance, I'm guessing, always acknowledged Mike and his audience. Magic, for me, whether I was in it, and there were times when I, I was professional, that was how I made my living, and now times that, it, that I'm not doing it professionally, it's still a fraternity, as people say. I think we see that today. And um, to give you an idea of that, when I was 13 years old, I worked in his shop. I've known him already for years. I worked in his shop that he owned in Myrtle Beach. And 25 years later, when Magic Masters suddenly uh, closed their location, and briefly Mike was out of work, I owned the Magic Emporium then, a, a pro shop here in Vegas, which is now getting the lease, and Mike worked for me. 25 years later, which me and Mike used to think that was the most amazing thing, and it is amazing, that that magic fraternity, and even when I owned that shop, I did something else, really, for my main source of income. But as I was discussing with Lance earlier today, once you're bitten by the magic bite, you're bitten, and it's for life, regardless of what you do. I think we all know people that have other professions, but go on and do it. What's amazing about Mike is he had so many opportunities, not within my own company, but other companies, to do other things and to make more money. When I opened the Magic Emporium, it was purely out of the love of magic. It's not what I was doing for a living. I could afford to do it, and I wanted to do a really large shop, Lance, and, and uh, so many Jeff McBride, and everybody in town, knowing how much <coughs> for a magic shop supported that shop. They didn't have to, um, you know, can tell if off the thumb tips and rope for me when they could have ordered it wholesale. Everybody supported it, which is just, I think, too, part of the love of the magic fraternity for me, is there's so much love within it. Uh, and um, Mike said to me when I opened the store and I came in, and Mike hardly ever said anything negative, of course, we know. He said to me, he goes, I have a joke for you, which, of course, you had every day, every minute. <laughs> and, magic, Mike. and I said, what is it? He said, how do you make a small fortune in magic? And I said, how? He says, you start with a large fortune like you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what you're missing. You gotta get a girl. You gotta date. Every time you make an excuse, you, you make friends out of them. You gotta date somebody. And he said to me, "I don't want to sound negative." He says, "But I, I, I'm giving up." Huh. I said, "Why?" He said, "Kevin." He says, "You remember?" And he named him. Uh, discretion will keep me from doing that here. But he said, yeah, "I guess I dated three women in a row, yeah. and each one of them, after one date with me, became a lesbian." And I said, <laughs> <laughs> "I said, Mike, I want to show you how much I've learned." to see the half glass, the, the glass full. And he said, oh, there's no way you can put a positive spin on that. That's just the truth. I said, Mike, do you believe they were probably born that way? You know? oh. He said, well, yeah. I go, then Mike, you're looking at this wrong. You were such a man that you got three lesbians to date you. I don't know who <laughs> I've been having so much trouble. 
For the last several years, I've had the best summer job you could ever have. I've been working in a magic shop. <laughs> now, he was in class through the, his, his senior year at college. He went everywhere with this big fisherman's tackle box. <laughs> and when he opened the tackle box, it was full of everything Ripley's Believe It or Not Magic Shop had. It was, it was segmented. It, it was, there were hundreds of tricks there. And he could perform at a moment's notice uh, for half an hour to a table full of people in the, the grill on campus. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I, I did magic for a little while back when I was 10 or 12. So that's really interesting. He said, well, this year I'm graduating and I'm going to take over the new magic shop Ripley's going down in Myrtle Beach. You need to come down there and be the best summer job you ever had. Well, I went down there and I worked for him and I actually lived with uh, Mike and Mary uh, and another. Now, he, his roof was open to anyone. Anyway. Um, me and another demonstrator both lived with him. Uh, and, uh, and then at the end of the year, I got married and uh, said, Well, I, I can't afford to go back to school. And so Mike said, Well, talk to Ron, Ron Conley, and uh, see what he can do for you. And he got me to go back to Gatlinburg, and I worked the next three years in the Gatlinburg shop that Mike had left, and, uh, and it, was, it was a magical time. Uh, Mike taught me uh, a lot about magic, and he also taught me a lot about selling stuff, because Michael not only could do magic, he could sell magic, but he didn't sell magic like somebody trying to sell you something because he needed a sale. He sold it like this is something I love. Don't you love this too? And he and you go, yeah, I want to do that too. And, and, and so he taught me a lot about magic and a lot about selling. So after four years in the magic shops, I went on to other jobs selling other things. But he had taught me so much about selling that I, I was good at selling anything because I found the thing to love about it and shared people with people the love of it. And they go, wallpaper? Yeah, I want wallpaper. Show me how to hang wallpaper. <laughs> Well, Rocky has put food on our plate. Oh my years. gosh. Uh, but, but wait, 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 wait. You have to stop right now. He came to our restaurant one day with that guy on his shoulder and walked through our restaurant. People were like freaking out. There was a creature in our restaurant. And he had that point to people's tables like to their food. Oh my god.